But the writing almost encourages skepticism, and it, you know, right from the get-go, it seems so completely manipulative. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Delicious. Just a reminder, a great free way to help the show would be to give a thumbs up or leave a comment. Everything goes to help feed the beast of the YouTube algorithm and it's sincerely appreciated. So thank you so much. Some of you may already be aware, but we have opened up a bookstore, a used bookstore here uh, at the headquarters, so to speak. You can find that on Instagram via the link below, although uh, all of the inventory is sold out. Currently, the only thing that is available is uh, I think uh, the first three volumes of uh, Anna Eastman's diary, first edition, uh, but there will be a lot of stuff going up soon. So please. We'd love it if you stopped by. And thank you so much to all the folks who have made the first week a great success. The main issue is that we really can't get stuff out fast enough, but there's a lot to come, so please go check it out. And to everybody who bought a book, thank you so much. And for the rest of the month of January, everybody who buys a book shall get a free signed bookmark. Also, if you'd like to support the show and you have books that you would like to offload, like you need more space on your shelves or whatever, you know, but you don't have any funds to support via Patreon or PayPal, we will happily take your books as donations that you think we'll be able to sell via the bookstore. We really appreciate it. You know, we won't take just anything, but if you hit me up and you're like, hey, you want X, Y, and Z, I just finished it and uh, I think it could sell, then it's like, yeah, absolutely. We really appreciate it and are, are very very, very grateful, so thank you. I don't know if it's a viable tax write-off yet, but, but I will see what I can do about that. Today's book was a gift from my good friend and patron, Josh. This is his favorite book, and it is uh, Ford Maddox Ford's The Good Soldier. And in our discussions about it, I think Josh mentioned that uh, this book that was published in 1915 was uh, the first time that this kind of style that it's written in had been attempted. So it's a modernist novel, but it's kind of early modernism. It's very unique. I think it's kind of uh, trailblazing. It seems to be on a bunch of prestigious lists, you know, like 100 best of the century or whatever. Joan Didion was a big fan, the recently deceased Joan Didion, rest in peace. This was on a list of hers that I saw recently. I'll, uh, I'll link to that below. So yeah, The Good Soldier was written by the English author Ford Maddox Ford, who at one point, at least, was friends with Joseph Conrad and Ernest Hemingway. Acquaintances, at least. It's an interesting story. So uh, Ford knew Hemingway and really endorsed his writing, but the admiration was not shared. In fact, Hemingway caricaturized Ford in a, a movable feast, which uh, I've actually got on the shelf, but haven't read it. And I think complained about his breathing or something, but but that's actually because of a uh, uh, an injury that Ford suffered in World War I from mustard gas. While Hemingway was a dick to Ford, I mean, let's call it what it is, I, I do share Hemingway's impression of, of Ford's writing, unfortunately. One article said that Hemingway immediately found Ford to be pompous and overly aristocratic. Sure, I'd, I'd definitely agree about his writing. Definitely describe his writing as that uh, in my first shallow reading of this book. But there's a, there's a, and I wanna underline this, the book is unquestionably intriguing and very intelligent. There's no way you can get around that. Josh actually described it as a writer's book which I thought was very interesting. There is a subtle complexity that is not immediately apparent. So let's discuss. Today's episode is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. These things are awesome. They are light, sleek, industrial, modern little pieces of minimalist design. Very, very cool. Holds up to 12 cards, plus room for cash on the back. This one has a clip. I prefer it, actually. Uh, it can go into your pocket if it's not holding cash for added stability. But you can put it in your front pocket, your side pocket. You can put it wherever you like. Just don't sit on it. This is the uh, stonewashed titanium model. Really, really cool texture. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can buy this one wallet and carry it for life. And speaking of, you know, soldiers and writing, uh, they have these uh, bolt action pens. This thing looks kind of like a rifle bolt. Very, very sturdy pen. I really hate writing on the uh, computer, actually. I have horrific handwriting, but I do prefer writing by hand. When you're taking your time, you know, the act of writing the words down on a piece of paper is so slow and cumbersome that uh, you're really internalizing whatever you're writing, buying a little bit of time to kind of um, decide in mid-action which word is actually most appropriate to go after the one you just put down. If this hasn't convinced you yet, please check out their 40,000 five-star reviews. 40,000. Get 10% off your order today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to rich.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thank you so much. All right. So, The Good Soldier was published in 1915, just uh, just right after uh, World War I started. In fact, the publishers wanted to uh, change the name because uh, or, uh, originally Ford wanted it to be called The Saddest Story. And they're like, nah, that's, that's really not gonna work. So, uh, Ford, uh, uh, in a fit of sarcasm, I think, actually suggested that uh, it be called The Good Soldier. 
And uh, they were like, yeah, that's fine. So, <laughs> so there you go. And indeed, the book starts with uh, the first line. So this is the saddest story I have ever heard. It's, uh, it's not the saddest story I've ever heard. Uh, that's for sure. So this is a non-linear narrative uh, based partially on the life and affairs of Ford himself, told through the American narrator John Dowell in a series of flashbacks, describing his tragic relationship over the course of nine years with uh, the Ashburnhams, Leonora and Edward Ashburnham, who is the good soldier, having served in India. Ironically, there really is no war narrative to speak of in the good soldier. Um, Almost, almost none. There's barely a military thing. It's not a military story. It's actually a story about uh, the intricacies of uh, human relationships. The tragedy that befalls John Dowell and the Ashburnhams. It's about this guy Dowell's relationship with his wife Florence and the Ashburnhams, whom they meet and befriend in Europe. You know, at the beginning of the book, he says, you know, this is the saddest story I've ever heard. This is John Dowell after all the events have taken place. He is a shell-shocked, emotional wreck of a man. The whole novel is him speaking to us and relating his story. He gives the impression of, of kind of, you know, getting lost in his thoughts and, and kind of barely keeping it together and wistfully displaying a kind of sad, tragic, remorseful, almost obnoxiously self-pitying tone throughout. And he is speaking to us as if in a, in a bar or a gathering of some sort. Perusing spark notes, I saw that they described Dowell as uh, passive and emasculated. That's accurate. In the story, he seems to be kind of um, somewhat in awe of Edward, like, you know, jealous in a way, but also loves him in a way. But this is a very interesting, unique thing about The Good Soldier. You can read this book in several different ways. And all of this uh, could be actually incredibly deceptive. We're not sure. We, ne we never figure it out. The irony on that level is that Dal is telling you this whole story as if, uh, as if you know, uh, telling it to you in confidence in a bar. And also, it seems, you know, judging from the writing, kind of putting together the pieces himself while he tells it, you know, about how he was completely in the dark, had no idea what was going on for nine years. But it's entirely possible the same situation is happening actually with you and I. And Dal is quite intentionally keeping us in the dark. It's, it's quite possible that Dal is not in the dark at all, but it's rather us who are in the dark, and Dal is keeping us there. The book is about the fact that Dal has been completely unaware of the goings-on around him for nine years. And when he finally discovers what's happened, uh, what's, what's been done to him, after more than one person is dead, it breaks him. And that's the version of him we receive the story from. Two characters from the story are now dead in the beginning of the book, thus the book's opening line. But the writing almost encourages skepticism, and it, you know, right from the get-go, it seems so completely manipulative. Even that first line, that, like, these frequent hyperbolic summary statements of what happened and how you should feel about it, you know, it's like, you know, setting you up. It's like, this is the most amazing thing. This is the saddest thing. And the most horrible thing was, and then, you know, until I realized that he'd start his stories in this manner to explicitly get you to see things his way. Very suspicious. Not, not once or twice, but when it's like every uh, few pages. You, you really start to be like, huh. And it's much more interesting if you read it in this manner, in my opinion. Um, just as kind of like a straightforward uh, book about kind of like a sad, mopey, um, naive, middle-aged man is unbelievable to me and kind of insufferable. What are you gonna do? So John Dowell is an actually wealthy American who, who basically doesn't do much except play nurse to this woman he's married named Florence who has, has a bad heart, which is actually just a ruse to get out of sleeping with John while having other affairs, including one with Edward Ashburnham. But Leonora is actually scrambling to cover and salvage what she can from Edward's philandering, miserable financial failures, coupled with his affliction of sentimentality, uh, which leads him to impulsively do both good deeds and women when the opportunity arises. Part of what was exhausting for me to read, in no small way actually, was what the book seems to be critiquing. That is the pretentious, you know, stiff, upper lip mannered life wherein uh, everything, absolutely everything is done uh, in order to maintain appearances. And all these people, all these characters uh, disintegrate under that pressure. The paths which energies or passions take start to resemble kind of these uh, insidious plant tendrils, snaking through cracks in the foundation, right? Ultimately giving way to collapse. That's what happens when there's no outlet, no catharsis, no truth in anything for these people. That's what happens after years upon years of sedimentary lies a fundamental breakdown. On another level, I think the book demonstrates just how easily one can destroy love in a relationship, and also just how far people will go to try and get it, or get it back, or, or what they think might be possible, uh, especially in Leonora's case in this book. I mean, she's trying to get Edward back by um, giving him women, so to speak, to have affairs with in a very strange way. Uh, you, you gotta read it in order for it to make sense. It's, it's difficult. 
uh, she thinks that she can change him, basically. It's, you know, that old chestnut. And just how filled with a poisonous hope they can become, wherein the hope turns into routine, turns into life, turns into insanity. And all of a sudden you've been behaving this way for years. Systems of hoping turn into malicious lifestyles, and all of a sudden, several years down the road, what once resembled a marriage is now something, something closer to like a silent cold war. Ford is always describing the characters as expressionless. There's a constant demeanor of emotional resistance and suppression. It's kind of like warfare, yeah. There is no war in the book, per se, but, th but there kind of is, right? It is sort of a war. It's a war between Edward Ashburnham and Leonora Ashburnham, and there are casualties uh, in the middle. I mean, it's very strange reading it as an American today, where the kind of modus operandi preached by society is is the the polar opposite. I mean, really. But what is indisputably interesting is that this book can be interpreted in multiple ways. In one way, you could read it as like, you know, John Dowell is presenting himself as this kind of self-pitying, brow-beaten, naive, moronic virgin. Now that might be what he is, but I think that that's actually what he would like you to think. I think that this is actually a tale of confession, of murder. A very elaborate, very twisted kind of uh, murder confession. When I think unreliable narrator, which is what Dowell is, most definitely, I, I don't think anybody's gonna dispute that, because uh, he contradicts himself in the story and all sorts, all sorts of stuff. When I think unreliable narrator, I think Poe. And when I think Poe, I think sinister. I think murder. And sure enough, a recent radio play adaptation really pushed this view of the book, wherein Dowell is actually kind of like this like weird serial killer criminal mastermind. It's it's over the top. It, it, Edward was pretty good, but but Dowell is, I mean, the, the voice acting for Dowell was kind of weird. He sounds more like, you know, uh, uh, Patrick Bateman than, than I pictured. I mean, they, they really pushed it. Now, the book is, the book is not nearly as explicit in that reading as the radio play adaptation was in that interpretation of the book, but it's a good one, in my opinion. Spoiler alert, spoiler, spoiler, skip ahead 15 seconds or whatever if you wanna read it first. Did Florence really have prussic acid? Did Maisie just happen to collapse from her heart condition when she did? Did Edward really pull the insanely difficult task of uh, suicide with a pocket knife? Really? Really? He has a gun room. He's, he's a soldier. The man has guns. He knows, he knows how to use them. He's, he's cleaning them, I think, at one point in the book. Or, or, or is the miserable, pathetic puppet actually the one pulling the strings? Probably not, but, but, there's just enough in the book to make you wonder. You know, and, and so I think this is all intentional, right? I think, I think that, uh, I th this, is, this is smart. This is a smart book. Uh, it's obnoxious. Sitting with Ford is an obnoxious. <laughs> endeavor. It is really something I had to endure. I mean, 10 pages a day, tops. And that was really, really like, I'm trying to read this book focused. It was very difficult for me to get through, but it's smart. It's smart. I think it's a case of me having to come up to its level instead of uh, having to descend to my level. I think it's intentional from Ford. And if in fact it was, then it's, it's very, uh, um, Clever. The novel is really at heart about the ambiguity of the world and relationships. There's no clear-cut course to happiness or anything. Really, nothing. The instances of honesty that one comes across in this world are just as amazing as the instances of dishonesty. After 45 years of mixing with one's kind, one ought to have acquired the habit of being able to know something about one's fellow beings. But one doesn't. I, I like that line quite a bit. It's a good line. You see, to give you an idea of how complex this thing is, you know, Josh had never considered the, the killer line of interpretation. And this is someone who loves the book, who, who knows the book through and through, who has like read it, reread it, and reread it. And it's not obvious at all. In fact, I did not figure that out on my own. The idea that he was a killer explicitly was given to me by the radio play. I, didn't, I did not figure that out on my own at all. But after I listened to that adaptation, I, I, started, I started to really think. It's not obvious at all. You, you could very well read the book and, and never pick that up at all. There's always this haze of subjectivity over the events because we're getting it from him. One can never get a clear picture of the events in the story, just as nobody can get a clear picture of anything in real life, including ourselves. Ain't that something? So in that respect, the book is profoundly progressive as far as revealing the impenetrability of the truth when it comes to human nature and relationships. The impossibility of ever really getting to the full picture, so to speak. Of ever really truly knowing anybody, anything, or anyone. I don't think we can. 
from what I can see. I, I don't think it's possible. The time span of human life doesn't allow it. Maybe if we had a, a lifespan of 500 or 1,000 years, then, then we would finally be able at one point to say that we could really see something from all sides, that we can understand the mechanisms of, of human thought and behavior, including our own. But the truth, as far as I can tell, is something closer to like the Socratic one, you know, which is like, nobody really knows anything, and we all know it deep down. I don't think that's actually what Socrates said or wrote or whatever, but you know, the idea of that. I don't even know that. I don't even know what Socrates really said. <laughs> there you go. We don't know anything. We don't know anything. Josh mentioned something that uh, was compelling to me, which is, you know, Dow, he, he doesn't really change exactly. He starts as a, uh, a man with nothing and he ends as a man with nothing. Nothing's changed. But it's also, maybe, maybe indeed it was a confession. So, who knows? So better than food? Nah. Interesting, certainly. Smart and complex. Ambiguous, uh, subject to multiple interpretations. But uh, for me, man, that writing, that voice, that guy, mm -mm. No, that's the kind of guy you get stuck with at a party and you just want to commit suicide with a pocket knife. Yeah, dry, dull, redundant writing. It's, it's like listening to a, a really boring guy tell you his sad story. I mean, that's basically what it is. Sure, it might be intentional, you know, that is how people talk. You know, they repeat and contradict themselves. It's meant to give you a sort of sense of realism. I get it, I just don't want that much reality when I'm reading a novel. Insufferably pedantic is what I would call his tone. And, and the footnotes are excruciating. It's like, uh, like several on every page and you gotta go look at these obscure references that mean nothing. So you should read it. Well, it's been called the greatest French novel ever written in English. I forget who said that though. Uh, I'll link below if I can find it. But I'm guessing they're referring to Flaubert, uh, Madame Bovary. It reminded me of Wuthering Heights and Madame Flaubert. So if you enjoyed either of those, uh, I, would, I would definitely check this out. But I would highly suggest reading it for yourself, especially if you want to see, from kind of like a writer's standpoint, uh, like just what literature can do and how complex it can be. There's no other medium that can do what it does. It's very BBC, it's very masterpiece theater. I mean, maybe John was gay and he just loved Edward and he knew he couldn't have him and so he wanted to kill him, but who knows. Ford reminds me a little bit of Uncle Monty from With Null and I. Not in that he's gay, just in that he's pedantic and pretentious. Oh, Oxford. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by. I take all of the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar and I send out for every review a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And if you're interested in supporting the show and checking that out, you can find more information below. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. If you donate a dollar or more on Patreon, you shall get all these reviews ad-free. If you're interested in supporting the show, there's more information below. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you very much to all the patrons, and best of luck. Okay, here we go. David, David M. Thank you very much, David. You're going to receive The Good Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford, plus some delicious coffee, and I hope you love both. Cheers. Thank you so much. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you have not already done so and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this and always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.